All right. We are in Apex, North Carolina, in the home of Phil and Jackie Stevens, Amanda and Lauren, and uh, we're talking with Helen Stevens, my nanny, my grandmother, and uh, just wanted to have a talk with her and find out a little more about her life and the life of her family. And I wanted to start out by just asking her some questions and to get her responses to those questions and then just kind of see where we go from there. And the first thing that I want you to do, Nanny, is just give me some biographical information about yourself. Um, tell us when you were born and where you were born and how you got to that place, uh, wherever you were born. I was born in Baltimore, Maryland. And that's where my grandmother lived. And my mother and daddy went there when they were first married. And I was born November the 2nd, 1905. And how long did you stay in Baltimore? We stayed there about a year. And then we went to Reisterstown, Maryland, which is in Baltimore County. Okay. And what took you there? Was it uh, your father's was, job? or mm -hmm. Okay. And from there, where did you go? From there, we went to my mother's home in Pine Point, Maryland. And we stayed there a year while some repairs were being made on the house at we were going to live here. Okay. And then once that house was prepared, was that also in Piney Point? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, from from that point, can you can you kind of back up and uh, and talk about your mom and dad and what their names were and how they what backgrounds they came from and how they happened to get together and that type of thing. Well, my father's name was Thomas Amory Eakin Hodgkinson. I like that Amory part. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> he was visiting friends at the lighthouse at Piney Point. And he met my mother, who had come to the hotel near the lighthouse to a Saturday night dance. And her name was Olive Guatha. And uh, this was in the summer, and that was a summer resort. Right. And they met. I am not sure, but I think it was in July of 1904. And uh, they became engaged that summer. He came back a couple of times to visit. And he lived in Baltimore. She lived at Pine Point. Which is what kind of distance? Oh, a very good distance. And 
In those days, they traveled by a steamboat from Piney Point to Baltimore, which was an overnight trip. We left about five o'clock in the evening. Next morning when you woke up, you were whichever end you were going to. Right. And what was his occupation? I think he was working at a bicycle shop. Doing repairs or... Mm -hmm. Okay. And so he was visiting friends at Piney Point and met your mother at a dance. And uh, was it love at first sight or was there a long courtship or...? Well, they were married that same year on the 29th of December. Okay. So it was not a long courtship. Right. And how old were they respectively when they were married? When they got married, they were 21. Oh, no, mother was 21. Daddy was uh, 26. And was that, would you say, a normal age? Uh, did people get married younger, like in 18? About that time, they married in the early 20s, usually. Right. Um, once they were married, they did they stay in Piney Point? No, they went to Baltimore, and they lived with my father's mother. about almost two years. Okay. And he was still working at the bicycle factory during this time? Uh, I don't think so. My father's parents were English and a gentleman didn't go out to work, so he was not trained to go out and make a living. He had uh, in an income, and he didn't need to go out and work. Now, when you say that that he had an income, his his parents were wealthy? Well, they weren't poor. Okay. And so uh, their basic subsistence was from that uh, monthly income or whatever. Yes. But he may have done a little odd jobs on the side mm -hmm. to kind of supplement whatever that. he wanted. Okay. Was it uh, in Baltimore that they uh, started their family. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, take us through that. Well, I was the oldest child, and I was, they were married in December of 1904. And I was born in November of 1905. And my dad's stepfather was, had become a doctor. And he was rather hard to get along with. And he didn't like children. And he threatened to do away with me. And so Mother and Daddy decided to move. Now, this is your grandfather that you're talking about, who did not... Step-grandfather. 
Right. Now, my grandfather had died earlier. Now, when you say had threatened, what what exactly do you mean? Well, we didn't exactly, mother didn't exactly know whether he would actually kill me or not, but he threatened to if I cried. So she, because he didn't like crying children. Well, mother was afraid to leave me around where he would be in the house. So they decided it was best to move. I'm curious as to how you would come to find out um, about his feelings. Did your mom discuss it with you? Yes, she did. Okay. And uh, when they moved to Royster's town, grandmother moved with them. Left him there. Right. I know that she even told him she was going. She just went. <laughs> mm. Um. So, sometime after you were born, then you moved mm -hmm. with your mom and dad to where? Brister's town. And is that where Hope was born? No. Okay. Hope also was born in Baltimore in a hospital. Which was unusual? Well, I don't know that it was unusual, but it was just beginning to be done. Mm -hmm. Okay, so at what point um, was it after Hope was born that you moved? From Rice's then. From Baltimore. Hope was born in Baltimore. Yes, but we were not living in Baltimore. Okay. We were living in Pine Point when Hope was born. Okay, okay, I've got you. All right. Because that was seven years after I was born. Right. We moved to Piney Point when I was three, almost. We moved in September and I was three in November. Okay. I've got you. All right. So, from the time that Hope is born, um, tell me where you went uh, and then bring David into the picture and where you went from there. Well, I, we live in the same house. Well, Dad had a new house built soon after we moved there. And uh, we lived there when I was 21. Okay. And Hope was born in 1913, in January. And David was born in 1919, in March. Hold that thought.
going to have to be so noisy. Mm. Okay. So, after David was born, tell us what happened. Well, let's see. I did a good bit of the housekeeping. His mother's health wasn't very good. And Let's see, I got married in 1927, and my middle brother died in 1928. Tell us a little bit about that situation. He was 13 and he developed spinal meningitis. He was taken sick during the Easter holiday and died two weeks later in John Hopkins Hospital. Did your mom, uh, based on the symptoms that he had, did, did they know what was wrong with him and, but just could not treat it, or was it a totally a mysterious... Well, we were living in the country, and the doctor did not know what was wrong. And he called another doctor in, and he said, he didn't know, but he advised us to take him straightway to Hopkins. We, Dale died in April of Tell me about about that experience. How did how did the family react? Um, well, mother went to pieces, and uh, she had a breakdown, and I had to take over the housework and the caring for David, who was three years younger. He was ten. So, did your mom ever she recuperate? Was, she was sick for quite a while. And she got when she got better my husband and I went to Florida, which was his home. And we lived there. Three years, I think, and mother got sick with du uh, double pneumonia, and I took Shelby, my first baby, and went back home to nurse her and she 
гораздо поднимаем мочи. Just couldn't seem to get well enough to get out of bed. I don't know. I never knew what the problem was, except that she just gave up, I think. And Hope was away at school, so I had to stay and take care of her. So we moved back to Merrill. Let's see what next. Well, you, um, I also want to talk to you about your relationship with your, uh, with your sister and your remaining brother because there is, um, some distance in age between all of you. Were you close, uh, at all coming up? Did you... Uh, or were you more of a mother figure well, to I, them? I was away a good bit because I went away to school, for high school, and I was going to college, but mother was sick a good bit through that period. I couldn't go. What college were you? Uh, going to attend. I was going to Goucher and Baltimore. And what was your interest in pursuing? Well, I wanted to be a nurse, and Mother wanted me to be a teacher, so there was a little conflict. <laughs> and I don't know who would have won, but. Uh, I looked after David for a good bit. By then, Hope was away at school because we had no high schools in the county at that time. You had to go either to Washington or Baltimore to high school. And that was a, a boarding school? No, it wasn't. I went to a boarding school in Virginia one year, and Mother thought it was too far from home. And uh, her cousin offered to let me stay with her and go to high school. And I just went home on vacations. Um, before you had told me the story about um, going away to school and and uh, getting your hair cut, to uh, recount that story for us. Well, I had long, heavy, thick hair. And it was just becoming the fashion to have your hair cut. So when I went to boarding school in Warrington, Virginia, first thing I did was to get my hair cut. And I didn't let me see, I didn't go home for Thanksgiving. So, Mother didn't see me until Christmas vacation. And what was her reaction? And she was not too pleased with me, but she couldn't put it back, so <laughs> she let it go. Would you characterize yourself as being um, an adventurous child, free-spirited, or were you forced into a more responsible mode? Well, in the early years, I 
guess uh, was more careful what I did. I might have wanted to do things, but you didn't disobey your parents in those days. And I don't know how I got up the courage to have my hair cut when I went away to school, but I guess it was the fact that I knew Mother wasn't that same thing about it. Right. Right. And my father wouldn't have cared as much about it as Mother would. Not the fact that the hair was cut, but that I disobeyed her. I think my dad spoiled me a little more than Mother did. <clears throat> I could count on him. <laughs> right. To kind of run interference for you. Mm -hmm. You have um, briefly touched on uh, meeting your husband, uh, my grandfather. I want you to talk a little bit about that. Um, where you all met and how you got to be where you were when you met and then we'll proceed from there. Well, let's see how I begin. My husband was in the Navy and he was stationed in sight of my home. His, he was on a tugboat at that time. They were testing sonar for the Navy. And they were stationed at Piney Point at the end of the Potomac River and they would take the equipment that they were testing out into the Chesapeake and he ran the tugboat. And one Sunday afternoon, I was with some friends at the beach about a mile and a half or two miles from my home. And he brought the group of men who were on leave ashore and he saw me and the next day he began trying to find out what I lived. It's crazy. Now did you also spot him that first day? Yeah, I saw him. <laughs> <laughs> so, the next Sunday, he appeared at church. And we met and talked quite a while and the church was over. And that's how we met. Now I've heard a rumor that it wasn't long after that before things progressed very rapidly. Take us through that. Well, we were engaged two weeks later on my 21st birthday. I celebrated. <laughs> 
Now, for that type of progression in three weeks, there must have been instant chemistry. What, what was it that attracted you together? I still don't really know. But just a feeling, I guess, more than anything else. Right. And then he was sent to Norfolk just a few days after that. And he was there six months. And we corresponded. And when he came back, we were married. Do you still have those letters of correspondence? No. It doesn't do to keep things <laughs> in a big family. Right. What What did your um, parents think of that whirlwind courtship? Well, my dad said this is kind of sudden. Mother said, talk to your dad. Did Dee Dee um, approach your father and ask for his blessing? Mm -hmm. And did he get it? Yeah. And how did he propose to you? Was it a traditional get down on one knee and... No, we were in a car. We were going to the movies. And we and? And he asked me if I would marry him. No. Did you hesitate? Well, not too long. <laughs> <laughs> Did he offer a ring or anything in token at that time? Mm -hmm. He gave me a temporary ring until he could get to Washington to get one. What went through your mind during the six months that you all were separated? Was there any doubt in your mind that once he got back he'd get married? No, because we said we would. So I was a scholar, I guess. I believed him and we did. Right. What kind of um, wedding did you have when, when you got back? Well, we had a church wedding, and I wore a traditional white dress and veil. Who were your attendants? Uh, cousins mm -hmm. and Pope, my sister. And I made their dresses, and they wore picture hats, and I trimmed their hats, and I made my dress. And where is that dress? Long ago. <laughs> Was Dee Dee dressed in military attire? No, he didn't want to be married in his uniform. He bought a suit. Right. And where did you honeymoon? We didn't get one because he had to go to Washington right away. He was still in that name. Right. And uh, so... So what were, were his duties in Washington? Uh, he... I don't think he was doing anything much right at that time because they were getting ready to leave for China and he didn't want to go to 
chance, so, and his four years were up, so he got out. But you were not allowed to travel to Washington with him? Oh yeah, I could have gone, but he didn't have a car at that time. On a ship, you don't right. have a car. <laughs> right. And he had been on a ship up until they were started testing the sonar. And when they finished that, he would have gone on the ship and gone to China. So how long were you separated from him after you got married? Just, uh, I think it was a week or so oh, okay. during the week, say on weekend. Right. So, and a few days of the next week. Right. And then from that period, he did what? Well, he was looking for a job. And let's see, what did he do first? That's a long time ago. But you all were in Baltimore? No, I never lived in Baltimore okay. after I was little. So when he got out of the service, where did you all end up? Well, we went to Florida, but we didn't go right away. I think we went just before Christmas of the year we were married. And there was not much in the way of jobs where I lived. And he just did whatever he could find to do by jobs until we went to Florida. Was he a very handy type person? Mm -hmm. So he could do a lot of different things with his hands and that type of thing? And when we went to Florida, he got a job with the gas company, manufacturing gas. Okay. And you had indicated earlier that Florida was his home state? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, were his parents still living at oh, that yes. time? Yeah. Okay. And were you all near them? Yes in the same town, fairly close. At this point in time, you had Shelby no. while you were in Florida? No, I had, I had him, yes, while I was in Florida, but it was uh, next year. Okay. Um, kind of walk through the sequence of your childbearing. Your children were born uh, fairly close together. Kind of uh, walk us through that, where, where you were and where they were born and a little bit of biographical information in, on them. Well. The first was born at Piney Point, Merrill. We lived with my parents until uh, Christmas of 27. And my first was born in November of 27. And then after I went to Florida, the second one was born in November of 28. 
and that would be Shep. And then when he was about seven, eight months old, I don't remember, it was a month, I went back to Maryland to take care of my mother. So Audrey was born in Maryland in March 1930. So how much time did you spend back in Maryland taking care of your mother? That month. I was still there when Audrey was born. Okay. And then mother got well enough I could leave her. <clears throat> We moved, I guess, about three miles <coughs> onto St. George's Island. St. George's Island, where Thomas was born in June of 31. Okay. And my mother got sick again, and we went back home to take care of her. <coughs> and Austin was born there in August of 32. Okay. just a short distance from home, about two and a half miles or so. <clears throat> and we were taking care of the house and garage for friends. The man had to go to Washington for treatment of some kind. I don't remember what. And uh, we stayed there till he finished his treatment and came back to his home. Let's see, we moved into a cottage on the beach. And there, John was born in 1934. I don't remember the date of the different moves, but circumstances moved us quite a bit during that period. And was Dee Dee supporting the family just through odd jobs through all of this period, or um, was he... Um, he still had some income. World War I took a good portion of it because England would not let it 
come out of it and going to be invested in the States. So he just got his monthly income until World War II came along and took the rest of it. But he was not supporting us. He did work. work on cars and garage while we were in Maryland. And after John was born, he got a job in Brandywine, Maryland. <coughs> Granddad got a job? No. Yep. My dad got a job in Maryland. No, let me think a minute. <laughs> Getting two people mixed up here. John was born. Yeah. John's dad got a job in Brandywine, and we moved there. We were there to years and we bought a house in Pamunkey. Pamunkey? Mm -hmm. And where would that be? In Maryland. Okay. And uh, in the meantime he had gotten a better job with the army engineers. I believe he worked for them two more years. All of this was during the Depression. We got married in the Depression. At times for tightening jobs hard to find. And the money for the job that they were doing, they were dredging it the channel in the Potomac up near Washington. It needed to be deeper. 
and money. Ran out and I had to wait until they could come up with more money to finish the job. So we went back to Florida and he got his old job back at the gas company. It just happened that a man had left. So, uh, Dale was born in 38 in Florida. We went in 36. She was born in 38. And we stayed there until the war started. Okay, we've talked about uh, the birth of your kids. One thing that I wanted to ask you about, you uh, briefly mentioned the uh, birth of your firstborn. Um, before Shelby. Um, can you tell me anything of what, what happened there? Well, I fell down the back porch steps, concrete steps, and in the afternoon, and he was born early the next morning. And it was a six-month pregnancy, and he lived two hours. And that was November the 7th, 1927. And after seeing what your mom had gone through, through the death of one of her children. How did you respond to that? Well, it was a shock and but you have to go along, so so you just kind of picked yourself up by your bootstraps? Mm -hmm. Was there, did you feel a period of somehow being, of guilt, of being responsible? In a way, because I had fallen so much At times, and as I got older, I felt more and more but I was sort of used to doing that and I, I didn't expect it to end a pregnancy. Did you name this child? Austin Canyon. And I don't exactly know why I named another one Austin, except that I like the name. How about the middle name? That's somewhat unusual. Well, that was Jimmy's father's name. Okay. And did you have a what would be termed a normal type funeral for the child, or? Uh, no. Just his father and grandfather. Right. And how much time uh, 
lapsed between his death and the time that uh, you were pregnant with Shelby? Well, he was born November the 7th, 27, and Shelby was born November the 21st, 28. Mm. Did you ever have any other complications with any of your pregnancies? Not until Mary. I had a little trouble. Your children were... Just at the time of birth. Right, not, not during the pregnancy. Mm -hmm. All your children were born at home? Mm -hmm. With any assistance? With what? With any medical assistance? Uh, the doctor got there in time for Shelby's birth. The doctor delivered first. And, let's see. I think the others were a little fast um, up until Mary. They didn't get to in time, but they were there mm. right afterwards. Right. Um, how did Dee Dee interact with his kids? Um, was he a participating father? Um, did he ever change diapers and... Oh, yeah. So he took an active role in the, mm -hmm. in the raising. Mm -hmm. um, if I got sick at any time, which was rare, he was a pretty good cook, I and mean, he could keep the house going. Right. He had had to learn how, because his mother was very ill with typhoid fever. When one of his sisters was born, and he had to keep house and take care of the children. Yeah. He wasn't all that old. Right. Was he a disciplinarian from his military uh, upbringing? A little. But But not I abusive. don't think he was any stricter than I was. The boys tell me I was too strict. Now, whether I was or not, I guess it's a matter of opinion. Did you believe in corporal punishment? If it was necessary, and sometimes I think it was necessary. And, and who would you characterize as the one who um, exceeded your patience more often than not? Shelby. <laughs> he didn't do the same thing twice, but he could do something as bad or worse the next time. <laughs> uh. Um, you were about to tell us about the start of World War II and the fact that Dee Dee had gone to, uh, to Portsmouth, to the and shipyard there. He worked in the shipyard during the war. Was that as a civilian? Mm -hmm. Okay. He was just 
couple of years, or maybe not as much as two years, too old for the draft. How, how old would you say he was? So the whole family picked up and moved to Portsmouth. Mm -hmm. We had a little trouble getting a house, but Jimmy was working with a man. His wife got sick and after a lot of going through a lot of red tape, he finally got permission to go back to where well, they were from the Middle West somewhere. And they sold the house to us. We were able to move them. But we for two or three months. Finally one. And people were sleeping anywhere they could find to sleep. What what were living conditions like? Well, I heard people say that they would rent a room in three shifts. There's one man got up and went to work, another one was behind him mm -hmm. waiting for the room. And how about the house that, that you all were living in? Was it it was a new house. The people who sold it to us were the first to live in, but it was small. It had a living room, dining room, kitchen, two bedrooms on the back. And you put nine people in that, you've got a house full. How did you manage? Was were you on a regimented we had schedule? Two sofa beds that help in the office. How long did he work in the shipyard? Four years. So basically till the end of World yeah. War Two. Mm -hmm. And then when the war ended and they laid off, so many were out of jobs at one time that you just couldn't find anyone anywhere near. So a man that he had worked with was going to run a he was from Rome, and he was going back home. And he told Jimmy to go with him. Maybe he could find a job in Rome. Well, they went up on the train on Sunday, so they'd be the Monday morning, and. There was, I don't know, some kind of a convention, right? and they couldn't 
get a room. So they went back to Lynchburg to spend the night. And Jimmy saw Ed and paper full of get. They needed a man at the gas plant. So he went there and got the job. Mm -hmm. And the other man went on back to run. That sounds providential, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So been here ever since. He sent back for the family. Mm -hmm. I had sell house. Moved. And you but we had to wait for that house to be finished. There had been no building here for years. It was all people were living in the houses. Right. And uh, People coming back from the war, so there were no houses here, and it took us about a month to find the house, and that had to be finished. It didn't take long, but it wasn't finished. And uh, so then we. Got moved. Which was what year? Forty six. And November. What <laughs> what was your impression of Lynchburg when you got here? Well I had been up a couple of times looking for a house and I guess it was the closest I'd ever been to mountains. And the streets were so narrow and how people got around. <laughs> but I soon got used to it. So in 1946, you're in Lynchburg, everyone is together again. Um, did you work in the home, just raising your kids, or were you forced to uh, well, get an extra job? During the war, I worked for the Spencer Company, and I worked with a doctor and women were working in the Navy Yard then. Started doing the beginning of the war, taking men's jobs over. And they weren't used to that type of work and a good man of them got injured. And there were a lot of women who got hernias from the work. I guess they didn't know how, and, and it was heavy work to a lot of them. So I would. measure them for support and when they came, uh, when they were made, sent to me, then I would fit them to them, make sure they were right and fit properly. So I did that all during the war. And I tried it here, but it didn't work. <laughs> so I went to work at the 
Blue Buckle. Oval. Oh. They weren't ovals, but they called it the Oval Factor. And I worked there for a short while. Had to go to the hospital, so I uh, didn't go back because the job somebody else had. To do. Why were you in the hospital? Mm -hmm. So I didn't work for a while. Because of a medical condition? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then Mrs. King had a stroke. She lived across the road from us. And John came home. He took in the wood and coal for them. And he told me about it and I went to see her. And the doctor came to see her while I was there. And he asked me would I be interested in looking after her. So we talked it over and I decided I would. So we moved across the road so that I could be in the house with her to look after him we were there. And then we lived after them for nine years. And then we were there two more years. We, were, we sold it in 1958. We bought a place from them. Your duties were mainly nursing mm -hmm. type duties, not mm -hmm. housekeeping. Well, yeah involved that too. But my work was payment for the place. Doctor uh doctor lawyer drew up the contract and I bought the place by nursing and housekeeping for her. Now, and I had all of the as except two rooms. During this time, though, you still had children in their formative years. They were all home except one. Right. Shelby went in the Navy while we were still in the first house. And the kids were going to public school? Mm -hmm. Was that Old Forest Road? Old Forest Road and Brookville. Okay. You see, the older ones were in high school. Audrey graduated the first year we were here. Okay. 40, June 47. Shelby didn't want to go to school and I made him and so he 
made a nuisance of himself. I let him go in the Navy. His daddy was going to make him stay there, but he was disrupting the teaching, the class. And, and did the Navy suit him? Yeah. Straightening out. <laughs> Well, since we've kind of talked about a couple of your kids specifically, I want to um, continue on that theme and uh, talk about them each a little bit individually and start that off by kind of doing an impromptu uh, first thing that pops into your mind. No right or wrong answer, just I'll give you a name and you tell me what pops into your mind. Okay? Okay. Thomas. Thomas. Went to finish school, but he worked while he was going to school. He always had a job. So he was the responsible one? Yes. Well, I wouldn't say the only one, because he wasn't, but Manage pretty good. What kind of character traits? He's good natured, always has been, and very seldom ever got mad, but when he did, watch out. How about Audrey? Audrey went to business college and worked for the government until after she got married. And she stayed at home for a while. And then she went back to work for the government. And what would you and say? Up. How about her character traits? She's good natured. She laughs a lot. If you talk to her on the phone, she sort of laugh so long while she's talking. <laughs> she's dependable. How about John? John finished high school and he had a job I believe he had a job before he finished school and been working ever since. And he's dependable and I guess pretty good nature for the most part. And he's always been religious, even as a little boy. I never had to make him go to Sunday school and church.
How about Dale? She's dependable. She and the sisters don't always see eye to eye, but that's as much one's fault as the other, I think. They're different than they. Order gets along with everybody, but she doesn't agree with everybody. Mary is quick tempered, well, tell you what she thinks and is sorry after. And Dale gets hurt at what Mary says to him. And I have a crazy mixture. Um, a little brief synopsis of Dale and Mary in there. Um, from, say, high school on where their life led them. They work until she was married. And they was a good worker. She learned quickly. She's got a good mind and she pick up things fast. Mary's not as fast as Dale is or as Audrey is. I think it may be because she didn't really like going out to work. But anyway, she did it. She doesn't make friends as easily as the other two girls. I guess her red hair is her problem. How about Austin? Austin has been less trouble than the other boys. Well, as the older boys, I'll say. Uh, He'd stand off and watch them do things and laugh when they got in trouble for doing it. <laughs> so he knew when not to be involved. Yeah. Right. And what kind of... He's got a 
a good mind and he is another one who I think learns fast. Thomas and Shelby took college courses after they went to the service. Austin didn't have time. Because the work he did in the service, he had to do a lot of studying as he went along for that. And uh, on the whole, I think he knows just as much as they do, though he doesn't have that little piece of paper that says so. <laughs> he did well in the service and continued the same work after he got out of the service. And I guess he makes a battle heaven than the other three. You have uh Oh, the two. I don't know that, John. I have no idea what he is in the company. He makes tons of money. Tons of money. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> you touched on uh, Shelby a little bit as being the impetuous one, certainly as a child. Um, did that um, follow him through his adult life? It did for a while, but I think he finally settled down. Because of marriages and going off to uh, service, a lot of the siblings were scattered. Um, did that affect their relationship with each other? I think to a degree it did. They never bothered to visit each other if they meet at home. They say they enjoy it and they must go raise it, but they never do. It's like they aren't in the same time. And that has nothing to do with the marriage. and probably has nothing to do with their family love for each other. I don't know. I guess not. It's very seldom that John ever asks about the others. It's very seldom that Shelby communicates with me or any of his brothers and sisters. 
Thomas keeps in touch and Austin keeps in touch and Audrey. And of course the other three are here. There, not here. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, but I don't believe they are if they were all in the same town. Some would and some wouldn't. But you don't know exactly what to attribute that to? No. I'd like to know how to change. <laughs> I want to digress a little bit. Um, how did Granddad get the name Dee Dee? One of the older grandchildren, I guess, when you started talking was trying to say granddaddy. I don't know what else. And everybody followed suit. It just stuck. Mm -hmm. Just like Nanny. She was trying to say granny. Do you know who that person was? Yeah. That was Linda, Shelby's oldest. <laughs> And Evelyn Thomas's oldest is the oldest of the grandchildren, but she wasn't close by. But when she did come, she picked it up. Did you call your husband Dee Dee? No. You, you referred to him as Jimmy. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what his middle name was until I saw it on my marriage license. And what was that? Bishop. He didn't like it. Was that a family name? I don't think so. I think it was for a friend. Which was odd. When did Granddad retired. Hmm. He tried to get disability insurance and wouldn't give it to him, though the doctor said he could not work. And, and, and why but, was that? Huh? What what he reason? Had emphysema so bad. He couldn't breathe. So he was a smoker. Mm-hmm. And that was in nine late night. 1958. He did work after that, but he was told that he couldn't. Was this with the same gas company that he originally? Mm -mm. Okay. At this point in time, what was he doing?
Oh, he was working with a contractor. When was he diagnosed with emphysema? In 1959. Actually, the doctor he was going to didn't know what he had. And he was at drugstore. Eating lunch. And another doctor came, sat down beside him to eat his lunch and ask him how long he had had emphysema. He said he didn't know he had it. So he changed doctors. <laughs> and was there any treatment? Yeah. But as it progresses, there's not much you can do for it. Was he in a lot of pain? Well, when you can't breathe, you are. And changing temperature, like going from indoors, outdoors in very cold weather, He just couldn't breathe at all for a short period of time. He died in what year? Seventy-two. So from 1958 to 1972, he battled emphysema. Mm -hmm. And he would get pneumonia so often because of the emphysema. In 1972, when he died, how old were you? 67. No, I wasn't. I was he didn't die in 72, he died in 67. When I was 62, he was 63. And his death was directly related to the emphysema? Had you mentally prepared yourself as best you could for that? Mm -hmm. Tried to. You never prepare even though you know it's going to happen. And I don't know whether it's right or wrong. But at the last, I prayed that the Lord would take him. Because of the suffering? Mm -hmm. 
So there was almost a sense of relief. In a way, you couldn't wish anybody to live like that. How did he feel about dying? He was ready. So what kind of impact did that have on you, not only mentally, but you were now 62 years old and by yourself? Well, I was very thankful that I was working. You keep busy. You get through things better. And it's not easy, but... Where were you working? Phillips Business College. Doing? We were both working. What were you doing? Well, he was doing maintenance work. And I was house mother. And were you living there? Mm -hmm. And you continued to live there? Mm -hmm. Two more years. Two more years? Mm -hmm. And from there you went where? I fell down in leg. The one supposed to be my good lady. And I went to Dale's. And Mary was pregnant and we came and begged me to come and live with her and take care of the children while she worked. And She'd been working, but somebody else was keeping the children and had to stop. So I went to live with her. And my leg healed. I was there uh, six years. Until Douglas went in the first grade. Then what? Then I went to Audrey's and looked after her kids. six more years. I don't know how it turned out to be six years, but it did. So you were in Florida? Mm -hmm. And from there you went where? From there I went into the Hillcrest Department. there five years and I got sick and Dale took me to her house and I was there seven years. That didn't divide up right. <laughs> She was having more than she needed to deal with, so I went to 
carriage here. And the family did not suggest that I go or put me there. I went of my own accord. I could have gone to one of the children, but they are getting old, and I just thought it was time they they were getting retirement age, and I thought they ought to be able to enjoy themselves a little bit. So, going to uh, Carriage Hill, you did basically because you felt like you didn't want to be a burden to anyone in your family. Not that they had in any way even hinted that that was what they thought was best. Do you enjoy yourself there? Mm -hmm. You're free to do as you please, and it's comfortable and clean, well kept, and I've met nice people. I wonder when you look back on this adventurous life that you have lived. Um, what do you look back on? I don't look back very often. You don't I'm reminisce? I'm apt to look ahead and I am to look back. All right, well tell me, what are you, what are you looking ahead to? Well, you don't exactly know what to look ahead to, but a day at a time you can pretty well look ahead a little bit. And I don't, I'm not one to make many plans. I do things more on the spur of the moment than I do plan them. Because plans don't always work out. You... I keep busy if I can. Right. Are there things though that in your, in your past that um, that you, when you do, on those rare moments, look back, you think, wow, that's, I'm really glad things turned out that way. I have often, when a change is made, several times, you know it's the Lord that does it, not you. And it's very obvious sometimes that, that there was a reason for me being where I was at that particular time. And I was reasonably certain that we moved to Lynchburg when we did because of Mr. and Mrs. King. They had no children. They had no living relatives closer than Richmond who were as old as they were almost. Mr. King had nobody 
what Mrs. King. He had no relatives in this country. And Mrs. King had a, a double first cousin and a sister and an invalid brother. One, the sister in Danville and the brother in Richmond, and they couldn't possibly look after her. So I must have been sent there to do it. And things happen that way with me every now and then. Well, I can't help but think that had you not ended up in Lynchburg, you and I wouldn't be sitting here today talking to each other. Who knows? <laughs> the other thing that you and I talked a little bit about last night, which I can only attribute directly to yours and granddad's leadership and the example that you provided in your home is the fact that um, all of your children are still married to their original spouses and uh, have great kids and um, I think that is certainly something that you should be proud of. I am proud of that. And the fact that they didn't get into any trouble, serious trouble, when the, through the years it, there's been so many temptations for young people. And it was starting when mine were in school. Out of all the things that you've been through in your life, up to and including right now, um, do you have any regrets? Is there something that if you could go back and do differently, you'd do it. I guess so. Is there anything that sticks out in your mind? Uh, no, one mistake that I made, I've made more than one, but this I think is a big one. I think a husband and wife should go to the same church regardless and I don't know why I thought that way because it certainly was stupid but I thought that anybody that didn't go to the Episcopal Church was a second-class citizen that nice families went there and other people could go to other churches. But I don't know why I thought that. I've no idea why I thought it, but I did. Well, I married a Baptist. He was a Baptist. And he didn't ask me to go to his church, but he would have continued to go, I'm sure, if I had gone with him. And he could not agree with the 
הוא היה בלייב. And so I was free to go to church, but he just stopped going. And then I told the children that when they got old enough to make a decision, that they could choose what church they wanted to go to, but they must go to one. And I know now that was a wrong decision. And what decision did they make? Well, Shelby's a Baptist. Audrey is an Episcopalian who doesn't go to church now because I think she's disillusioned with it. It's changed considerably. Thomas is a Methodist. His wife prefers the Baptist church, but she goes with him because she said that he tends to not go at all if she doesn't. Austin doesn't go to church, but he did become an Episcopalian when he was young. Doesn't go anywhere in that. He says he believes the right things, but you have to do more than believe the right things. John, okay. Mary's Baptist. Her husband's Presbyterian. And he goes nowhere. Dale and Alan are Baptists. It's a mixed up family. But you trace all of that back to the fact that you and Dee Dee didn't my, go. I think it's my fault. So what would you have done differently? I'd have gone to church with him. He would have gone to church by I'd gone with him. How do you want to be remembered? I don't know that anybody will bother me to remember me. I've done nothing for them to remember. Nothing worthwhile. How do you wish to be remembered? Well, I would like to have done something that would make a difference. Don't you think that... I haven't made a difference. At least I don't know it if I have. Well, I would tend to 
believe that you're selling yourself way short if for no other reason the tremendous impact that you've had on your kids and their kids and their kids I mean we all have a little piece of you in us well I know you do but I don't know that it's a very worthwhile piece <laughs> well I think you're being humble um, uh, I am very conscious of the fact, for instance, that I've never been instrumental in leading anybody to Christ. And I think everybody should. But you don't know the impact that even your living the Christian life has on other people that see you, even if you don't verbalize it, you can have a tremendous impact on people by living it day in and day out what you've done. I don't feel like I've accomplished it. <laughs> All right, here's, here's a profound question. With, with no humility, just give me your straight shot. If you could carve your epitaph today, what would you want it to say? You don't get any parentheses. <laughs> a great mother, a great wife. Lived life to the fullest. I had a full one, I'll admit. I've learned a lot. Learned a lot, lived a lot. Mm -hmm. 